baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Thank you, Brother Thompson, and by the grace of God, I will. Amen. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll tell you sincerely, there is just a, a delicious atmosphere around here. Whoever told anybody that about the old coal north, anyhow? Whoever said anything like that? That is a misnomer. There is a tremendous spirit of warmth and congeniality. This weather is beautiful. I called home today and it was 105 degrees. And I said, thank you, Jesus. And when I read in my papers in January that the snow is neck high to a giraffe up here, and it's 20 below zero, I'll say thank you, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so this year, Brother Thompson, I've had the best of both worlds. How delightful it is for the Tennies to share this time with you. And I tell you, I know a camp meeting atmosphere when I feel it. And it's camp meeting time in Connecticut. Yeah. Can you say amen? Yeah. Turn around and shake hands with somebody and say it's camp meeting time. Do it. It's camp meeting time. Come on. Sh shake hands with somebody else. Pass it along. It's camp meeting time. Yeah. Yes, sir. Praise God. Praise Who have we come to worship? Jesus. What is His name? Jesus. Who saved your soul? Jesus. Who answers your prayers? Jesus. Who heals your body? Jesus. Who bears your burden? Jesus. In whose name have you been baptized? Jesus. Oh, I believe I'm in the right place. Jesus, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, we're fixing to have church. And I don't care what some of our stage theologians might say, God is alive. Several years ago I heard a pastor tell of some theologians that came to his office. It was in the 60s during the time that Al Tizer and Fletcher's situation, ethics, and God is dead theory was prevalent. Can you remember when God is dead was so prevalent? Well, I'm glad God is dead is dead. You don't hear that anymore. But he said three men came and sat in his office. He was a pastor and said, Pastor, we've come to tell you that God is dead and we want to explain to you the premise of our theology. And he said, I listened to him talk to me about my God being dead. He said, I got as ridiculous as they were. I said, sir, if God is dead, where is the corpse? He said, they looked at me. I said, and besides that, if God is dead, who was the coroner that performed the autopsy so we can find out what he died from? And he said, not only that, if God is dead, which one of you fellas knew him well enough to identify the remains? And he said, not only that, if God is dead, why wasn't I notified? I'm next to kin. Yeah. Oh, hey, my God's alive. Alive, 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 alive. God's alive. And he's an exciting God. Now let me tell you something. I don't know about your God, but my God's not old. Some people think of God as a benevolent old grandfather sitting on a fleecy cloud with a long beard. My God's 21 years old. He is a young God. He's got young ideas. He's not some old stoic father up there. He is a young God. And, I, and he, he, he can even be an extrovert. Now, he can be grieved, but he can be an extrovert. If you don't believe it, you ask Saul of Tarshish. Saul is riding down the road one day and, and the Lord just slapped him down and said, Hello, I'm J.C., who are you? And, oh, Paul, oh, what an introduction, you know. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And we're just, just having a great time. 
We're going right into the Word of the Lord tonight. 91st Psalm. Now, that is exactly where we left off last night. Back to the 91st Psalm. And I want to tell you that I'm going to preach again tonight. I'm not going to preach and I'm not going to teach. I'm going to preach. And uh, tomorrow night, God willing, we may get back on the regular camp meeting fair. But I, I don't know. I just feel like talking from the overflow tonight about this, this great God and giving you some principles that I think will mean more to you in the days to come than they do now. Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Our Father, we take dominion over every spirit that would oppose the work of the Holy Spirit in this service tonight. We bind every adversary, every spirit of distraction. They don't have any business here, Lord. The devil will not be comfortable here tonight. In the name of Jesus, we plead the blood of the Lamb. Bless us, Lord. Let the Word have free course. Let us be excited by the concepts of God. In the name of Jesus. I love you, Lord. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Last evening, we dealt with verse 1 and introduced you to the shadow of the Almighty. We met, we met personally El Shaddai, the strong-breasted, all-sufficient, nursing God. And we found that if we had to depend upon Him as an infant child, its mother, then that made us a baby, helpless. And that we had to fall before Him, prostrate in trust. We found that if we would do that, that we could come under the shadow of the Almighty. I explained to you that God's names reveal God's characters. And as God wanted to reveal Himself to a different dimension throughout the old book, he would coin for himself another name or title that would explain to people the dimension of God that they were exploring then. God was wading into human history. The knowledge of God had been lost in the Garden of Eden. And little by little, he's bringing us back to our Edenic state. He had to reveal himself afresh and anew to God. Because man lost everything in the garden. In verse 2, after telling us that El Shaddai can be our shadow, he said, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. And I want to introduce you tonight to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress. Not El Shaddai, into whose tent I rush for sustenance, protection. But the Lord, virtually every time Lord is translated in the Old Testament, it means Jehovah, especially when it's capitalized or in all caps. Jehovah. Let me explain something to you about Jehovah. That particular name of God was so sacred until the Hebrew scholars and rabbis were afraid to write it. And when they did write it down, they had to disrobe, take a bath, dress, take a quill, Write the name, one letter at a time, lay down the quill, take off the clothes, take a bath, ceremonial cleansing, put some more clothes on to make sure they were clean. 
So rather than write that name, they got to abbreviate in it, J.H.V., and it has been interpreted Jehovah. Most scholars agree that it, it's closer to Yahweh, but it is a mysterious name, and I'm not going to delve into that, whether it is Yahweh as the ancient Hebrew scholars say, or Jehovah as we are more equivalent, is more equivalent to our, to our thinking. It was the personal name of God that he shared with his people. Now this is a further revelation of certain aspects of God's character and person. Now, Moses said, I found him as El Shaddai in the shadow of his tent. But I will say not of El Shaddai, but of Jehovah. He is my refuge. Jehovah, or Yahweh, was the covenant name of God. It was God's most personal name in the Old Testament. The personal. For instance, you may know me as, they say in our colloquial world, Reverend Tenney. I don't know what's reverend about me, but minister of religion. Some of my neighbors and cohorts may know me as Mr. Tenney. Many of our brethren call me Brother Tim. My close friends call me Tom or T.F. And I will not share with you a few other things I've been called. But <laughs> The more intimate you get to know a person, the closer you get to their most intimate name. And the most intimate name of God in the Old Testament was his covenant name, Jehovah. And he only revealed that name in all of its power and dimension to covenant people. Now you follow my line of thought. Covenant people know a dimension about the name of a covenant God that other people don't know. That doesn't mean they can't articulate that name and say it. Anybody can say Jehovah. The pagans in the Old Testament could say Jehovah. The heathens could say the name. But only the covenant people knew the secret. He that dwelleth in the secret place is not only going to know El Shaddai, but he's going to find out some secrets about the covenant name of God. A couple of times in the Old Testament, men that talked with the Lord were told that there's some aspects about my name that's a little secret. Why ask about after it? There is a mystique in God. Now, these Hebrews revered this name. They loved this name. It was God's personal name. All people knew the Almighty God, the God of creation, Elohim, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, knew El Shaddai, right down through the end of Genesis. There was this progressive revelation. Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, Elohim. That's the created name of God that we talked about last night. Create! The heavens and the earth. And then... In the 17th division of Genesis, we met El Shaddai, the strong breast. We're getting a little more intimate with him. But in Exodus, this name, Jehovah, was displayed and they knew him by that name. So, when Moses wrote this psalm, he said in verse 2, I'm going to say to Jehovah. And I'm going to get a little more intimate about this refuge and fortress business. And Moses knew what he was talking about because when the Lord commissioned him by the burning bush to go deliver the children of Israel, he said, well, when I go to deliver them, the first thing they're going to say is, who sent you? You don't have credentials to deliver us, Moses, unless you got the right name. You can do a lot of speculating, but he said, I know well enough that they're going to get that name involved and make an issue over it. 
Now, right off, what difference does it make, Moses? What the name of whatever God? Just so they get out, he said, no. said, uh, little by little, they've been pecking at it. Elohim, El Shaddai, and they're going to say, who is the name of your God? And really, Moses was saying, now, God, who are you? At your very heart, I want to know who you are. Because if I can find your name, your name's your character, I know what you will predictably do. He said, you go tell them that I am, that I am sent you. Now that is the transliteration of Jehovah or Yahweh. Because Jehovah means I am the living eternal one. I am that I am. Now Exodus 6 and 3 he said, I was known unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name of the God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known unto them. Well, now, wait a minute, Brother Tenney. Do you mean to tell me that Abraham didn't know the name Jehovah? Exodus 6 and 3 said, by my name, Jehovah, I was not known unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, stay with me. I'm preaching. You see, there was a time in my life when I would have told you, if you asked me, Brother Tenney or T.F. Tenney, do you know the Holy Spirit? I'd have said, yes, I know the Holy Spirit. He is the third person of the divine trinity. How do you know that? Because Dr. Roberts, who was my teacher at that time, taught me that the Holy Spirit was the third person of the divine trinity. And they also said, if you try to understand the trinity, you will lose your mind. If you deny it, you will lose your soul. Ooh, you're talking about confusion. I knew it by creed. I knew it on paper. I knew it by my church's doctrine. But ask me tonight if I know the Holy Ghost. I don't know him just as a creed, my friend. But I know him as a living Lord that abides in my heart. God said, now, now Moses, people knew my name, but now you're going to live out who I am. Just as Abraham found me as El Shaddai and had to live out what I was by coming to the end of himself and totally trusting me for a son at age 190, so you're going to have to live out in the commerce of life the fact that I am the living, eternal one. You're going to understand the covenant name of your God. Now, first of all, let me tell you that Abraham did use the name Jehovah. Follow me. Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth. Ten words, six days, and it all sprang out of nothingness. In the beginning, that's Elohim, the mighty God, the God of power and creation. And my relationship with Him there is creator and creature. My relationship with Him as El Shaddai is a helpless individual running into His tent. And when I see Him like that, I feel my infiniteness and my smallness. Now, in Genesis 2 and 7 is the first time we run into the name Lord or Jehovah. He refers him to himself as Yahweh or Jehovah in the second chapter of Genesis when he gives the explicit dimensions of how he made man. He spoke of his covenant name. Not with creation. But with this man I'm making, initially in Eden, I'm in a covenant relationship with him as Jehovah. Of course, we do know that that was lost. But originally, man had the covenant name. When Satan came to Eve, now hang with me, man originally had the covenant name, but lost it. I could go to the book of Acts and tell you, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. 
that there was a time when the new creation, the church, had his covenant name. And it was lost. But it emerged again as God step by step. But that's another story. And I'll get to that later. Satan came to Eve. And notice what he said to Eve. He didn't say half Jehovah said. But he said half God Elohim. That great creator Eve that's so far removed from you. That distant God way up in the ethereal nebulous. Did he tell you that impersonal God not to eat? Now, he knew better than to say, did Jehovah say? Because that was the sweet name. That was the covenant name. That was the name that they were never to transgress against. Now, whenever God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, the scripture says, Jehovah drove them out. Well, why? Why did it say Elohim, the God of creation, drove them out? Because they had not transgressed against the Creator. They had transgressed against their friendship and their enmity. So it was that God, that dimension of God that they transgressed against. And Jehovah drove them out. Elohim is the all-filled God of the distance, the God of creation. But Jehovah is the one who comes after me and seeks to make covenants with me and establishes a personal relationship with me and loves me. The devil didn't care how much of a rupture came between them and any other dimension of God. If I can just get the thin edge of the wedge in and break this friendship relationship, this covenant name you'll note that Israel always thought of him as the one who brought us out of Egypt the Lord who Jehovah the friendly God that came down the covenant God and brought us out of Egypt when I think about Jesus I don't think about a babe in a manger or a dead man on a stick as a believer in South America said he used to believe Jesus was But I believe in Him as a resurrected covenant Lord that brought me out of Egypt and promised me He would deliver me and He would keep me delivered if I would believe in Him. You know, really understand, it's nothing for a man to be born. A lot of men are born. Nothing for a man to die, even on the cross. Men died on the cross. But when a fellow says, look, gentlemen, I'm going to die on the cross. They're going to put me in a grave, but don't give anybody my job because Monday morning I'm going to report back for duty. Well, you've got something to go on then. And that's exactly what he did. He made a covenant with him, and he came back. I'm not only promising you that I am going to deliver you from death, but I'm going to explore the vast treasuries of pain and conquer death and come back and make a covenant with you. Oh, death, where is your thing? Grave, where is your victory? I am in covenant with a God that brings us out. Personally, I don't know just about Him. Hmm. But I know him. He brought them out of Egypt. You know, the Egyptians worship many gods. Nile River was a god to the Egyptians. Did you know that? They made a god out of everything. Once, once a year, the Pharaoh went down to the Nile River and they sang hymns. And some of those hymns exist today. One of them went like this. You are the goddess of life. That overflows our fields and gives us bountiful crops. Oh, Nile, you are everything. So God said, okay, Moses, you've got to go back and break the power of these demon gods. So the first thing Moses does is zap. The goddess Nile is turned into blood. Your God's dead. Stinking red blood. You call it life, I'll show you it's nothing but death. You know what lives in the Nile? Frogs. Frogs can't live in blood. So they start coming out. And they worship frogs. 
gods. They thought frogs were gods. And frogs were all over the place. Frogs came out. Every kitchen was carpeted with frogs. Praise God. And every time one of them croaked, they were saying, There's one living eternal. There's one living eternal. There's one living eternal. And there's one living eternal. Amen. They even worship locusts. They worship flies. They worship everything. And every behind every Egyptian god was a demon power. And every time one of those demon powers were broken and defeated, another shackle fell off of Israel and they were on their way to deliverance by the name of Jehovah God. I know a God's name that will get you out of Egypt. I know a name that will break every shackle. I know a name that will defeat every demon spirit. And I want to be intimate with that name. I want to be intimate with that name. I want a relationship with that name. I want a name that has life. Even Jehovah, even Pharaoh one time had to admit that Jehovah's God. God had promised to Abraham he was going to do it. And when he says something... He means it. I am going to do it. You see, that name, Jehovah, was an action name. And just the mention of that name, I am that I am. Tell them, Moses, that I am sent you. And brother, I am. Zap the frogs. I am zap the locusts. I am zap anything that rises up against it. There was just something about the breath of that name and the power in the hand of a man called Moses when he wielded that name that excited them. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about or not, but I've got a name that excites me. I do not mean to speak disparagingly, but I have never seen anybody shout over the Holy Trinity. I revere anybody's concept of God, but it, there, there, there is an excitement in this I am. It's almost weird. What's your name? I am that I am. I'd expect the name of God to be a little mysterious. You see, God doesn't have any casual callers. If you want to know this name, you've got to. To hunger for it. Not just be a curiosity seeker. You've got to, it's a revelation. And you've got to really want to see it. But Paul said in Romans 1 that the Godhead was a revelation. And this mystique of a God in the Old Testament said, now if you want to be intimate with me, you can, but I don't want curiosity seekers. If they uncovered the lid of the ark, God killed them because He didn't want anybody with curious eyes looking on. And what is a light to some people is darkness to others. Now that cloud, pillow of cloud, was light to the children of Israel. They were shouting it. I see the light. I see the light. I see. And the Egyptians that didn't want to see it, that believed in many gods, said it looks like darkness to me. didn't want to see it. It's mysterious. I am. Very personal. God is not an it. He's not a force. He's a living person. I am. I heard a missionary tell about an old African just, just recently. Many years old. Up in his 80s or 90s who had been reared in a village way back in the jungle and had been taught all of his life that idols were gods, wood, stone. This is your God. Before the missionaries ever got there, he sorted out a different theology for himself that told him these idols weren't God. That God 
was something else. And, and the missionaries, after they got there and explained the war way more perfectly, they said, how in the world did you ever come to this concept? He said, well, he said, I am a who. And an it can't make a who. Now, that was his theology. He concluded that those it's of idols could not be persons because he was a person. Anybody can say, I am, but not really. If I am, I am because he is. I have to get my am, I amness from something else that's living. I am dependent. He is not. He's the only one that can say, I am, period. He is the only one. Because he is totally independent of anything else for life. I only enjoy life because he lives. And he said, because I live, ye shall live also. If you know this intimate name of God in a living relationship, not just Polly Parrot style, but a living relationship with this name, you have plugged in to the infinite source of life. We all began. He never began. He is. Does he have life? No, he doesn't have life. He is life. Another name they often gave him was the living God. They like to talk about that. He's the living God. The living God. The covenant. Living God. I am. Never I was. And never I will be. Always I am. See, it's hard for me to comprehend the unchanging because I live in a changing world. Everything changes. I'm changing. I've reached the age of the four B's. Yes, the four B's. Baldness, bifocals, bulges, and bunions. I am changing. The only thing I know that doesn't change is God. And I want to get plugged into something that doesn't change. I want to stumble into something that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And identify myself with that, that I am now. All he was, he is. All he ever will be, he is. He always is and always has been. He doesn't stop being what he was to become what he is. And he doesn't stop being what he is to become what he will be. The difference between the Father and the Son is God beyond and God related. God veiled and God unveiled. This is is His covenant name. And oh, when you enter into that covenant name, on the Mount Sinai with Moses, He used this name, Jehovah. I'm going to make a covenant with you. You can read about it at your leisure. Exodus 24, 8, the elders killed a blood sacrifice. And then in verse 11, the Bible said they sat down and ate. The connotation is they ate with God. Now you check it. To get in a covenant relationship, there's got to be blood and a covenant meal. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. When God came to Abraham across the plains of Mamre, he sat down and ate a meal with him, a covenant meal. Before the children of Israel got out of Egyptian bondage, they ate that covenant meal. Entering into a covenant. A name, blood, meal. Praise God. The word loving kindness is a covenant word. It's not found until after the book of Exodus. And it is one of the untranslatable words. There's some words in the Bible untranslatable. For instance, Paul said, If any man love not the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema. That means a curse as curtly as I can make it, but I have read Hebrew explanations that were five paragraphs long of that one word. So the translator just put anathema. 
And the word loving kindness is a covenant word. It means I am bound to you with a love that will not let you go. I am bound to do you good in every way I know how. And we enter in, the Bible teaches us, to a covenant loving kindness with God. Another transliteration of loving kindness is womb love. And this Jehovah, our refuge and strength and our covenant God, said, I love you with such a love until I will enter into a covenant with you that I will never let you go. And I will always do you good. I didn't say circumstances will always look like that. Brother Tenney, how can I know that? I'll tell you how you can know. Hebrews said he swore by himself because there was no greater. What? An oath and a promise. Hallelujah. How could God swear by Himself? I can't explain it except like this. And this doesn't make sense. God got out of Himself and God looked up at Himself and God swore by Himself. I'll never leave them. I'll never forsake them. I will perform my covenant to Abraham and his covenant children. And you're looking at a covenant child of Abraham who believes in the Lord God Jehovah. See, Abraham found out on the mountain who Jehovah Jireh was, the Lord that helps when you get in a tight spot. Again, he said, I'm Jehovah Rapha. That's the Lord who heals thee when he healed the bitter waters. In the battle against the Amalekites, they erected an altar to Jehovah Nisa, which is the Lord our banner, the God that fights on our behalf. You see, when you come against us, you're not knocking us out. You're striking at God, and your arms are too short to box with God. If I'm in a covenant relationship with Him, and live in a covenant relationship with Him, and live in the covenant of loving kindness with Him, and walk in such a way as to please Him, I have a banner over me. Jehovah! Covenant name, Nisa. Jehovah! Rapha! Jehovah Shalom. Gideon in the midst of war found Jehovah Shalom. That is my peace. Jehovah Roha. The Lord is my shepherd. The God who's committed to guide me. Jeremiah prophetically saw him. Jehovah Sitkanu, the Lord my righteousness is coming. Taking away my own filthy righteousness and giving me some fresh righteousness. And Ezekiel rounds out the Old Testament names by... Telling us he'll be Jehovah Shemar, which is the Lord who is there. Now, Mount Moriah to meet the Lord my provider. Down by threshing floor to meet Jehovah Shalom. Who? Wore out already. Run up to the Mount of the Amalekites to meet Jehovah Nisa. Run to the valley of the shadow of death to meet Jehovah Rohi. But God said, one of these days, there's going to come a time when all of these covenant names are going to be taken out of places and wrapped up in one person. And if you can ever find that one and find that covenant name, you're going to find all the promises of the old book wrapped up right there and you won't have to go anywhere else or tend to ter- turn to any other living person. You are going to find that Jehovah Covenant God in all of His names, in one place, in one person, known and recognized by one name, and that name will do everything the covenant name of God in the Old Testament did. That's why I want an intimate relationship with that name! Let me flip ahead a little bit and tell you, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among me. I know a name that brings righteousness. I know a name that brings healing. I know a name that brings peace. Moses pursued after that God. One day he said, God, 
I wish you'd show me your hinder parts. If you can't show me anything else, I said, I want to see your glory, but I'll take what I can get. He said, well, my hinder parts is all you can see. The back parts. That's what it said, back parts. And that's the only part of God I guess any of us can see. Because after something is done, we say, that's God. Scripture in the book of Revelation that said, We shall see His face. Oh, from that glory, God said to Moses, I'm going to announce to you my name. I'm going to come in loving kindness. But I'm not going to tolerate sin. He said, I'm going to fix it where I can fix your sins and give you covenant names and give you more. You see, God's cup always spills into the saucer. He's always a more than God. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask a thing. Remember at Cana of Galilee, the very end of the wedding, they ran out of wine. Do you know how much he made? 280 gallons. And the feast was nearly over. An abundant God. Feeding the 5,000 one fish sandwich each would have been a miracle, but he left 12 basketfuls. Too much. Loving kindness. The final revelation of this God. Jehovah came. All of it the prophet said. Isaiah 52 said, there's coming a day when my people are going to know my name. Now you can think that I'm an egotistical toad swat, swatting and slamming and sitting on the thumb of revelation if you want to. But I really believe that there's something special about God's name. And if you want a refuge and a fortress, because there's times when the tent won't do, you've got to get into a stronger place. You can start off as a suckling child with El Shaddai, but there's going to come a time when you're going to need to get in the fortress. And to get in there, you need another name. Jehovah. Oh, the name of the Lord is a strong... Moses was never satisfied. He kept exploring and exploring. Never satisfied. Finally! John said, In the beginning, Hallelujah, was the Word. Our Bible teacher mentioned it yesterday. Logos. Thought. Concept. It was a word in ancient Greece used Considerably in the theatrical world. A master scriptwriter had a logos, a thought or a concept that he wanted to portray on the stage to an audience. A story to tell. A truth to impart. God said, I've got a concept. Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. How am I going to convey it to the audience at planet earth sitting in the amphitheater of life? In the doldrums of Satan. He said, I know what I'll do. I'll not only write the script, but I'll come down and play the leading part myself. Right. Yeah. Hallelujah. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. All of that Word from creation, Elohim. All of that Word from El Shaddai, the strong-breasted one. All that word from the great I am became a resident hallelujah and became flesh and tabernacled tinted shadow of his tent among us oh what a God and now we understand you hungry Jesus said I am bread you need direction? 
I am your shepherd, the good shepherd. Thirsty, I'm that rock. I'm the water of life. But we don't know where to go. I'm the way. But we don't know the truth. I am the truth. But we want to get into that I am life. I am the life. I, and when he started saying I am, I am, I am, that's when the Jews wanted to stone him. He said to them, you know, they were picking at him. You're not a man yet 50 years old. We've got Abraham to our father. He said before Abraham was. Before Abraham was, I am. Now that's bad grammar, Jesus. You could have said I pre-existed before Abraham. Because that's what a lot of people believe. But no, you said I am before Abraham was, I am. See, we live on a timeline. Whatever I just said is already past. It's gone. The minute I say it. Now is only a split second. And it's gone. And we're locked into time. Everything's on a timeline. Everything was, 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 was. And was before Abraham. Back in the past. But Jesus said before Abraham was. Now he said I'll admit before Abraham was. But he jumped off the timeline. He said I am. And the Jews said, you're claiming to be Jehovah. They knew what he was doing. And they picked up stones. They said, you being a man, make yourself God. No, you got it wrong. He being God made himself a man. Ah, Hallelujah. Before Abraham was, I am. And the great I am is here to say, I will. Jesus is in the garden and the soldiers come to get him. Jesus said, who do you seek? They said, we seek Jesus. King James Version said, he said, I am he. But the Greek says, I am. And you read it. When he said that, the soldiers fell back. What? They just knocked them back. Dear Lord, I'm going to tell you, when this gets you, it'll zap you. Hallelujah, there's power in this revelation. That's why the devil doesn't want the world to know who he is. That's why who he is does make a difference. Hear me, Jesus Christ is holy, solely, fully, absolutely, and completely God. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you're only complete in that revelation. You need a fortress and a refuge. There's something about that name. Jesus said, you got it? Got it. He said, okay, last supper. Here's the cup. The bread. We're going to eat the covenant meal. This, he said, is the new covenant in my blood. Covenants are the territory of of Jehovah. Jeremiah 30 or 31 spoke of a new covenant, but no one had used the covenant term since Jeremiah till Jesus said, Here it is. Well, they knew right away something's coming up because he said in Jeremiah, I'm going to write my law not on stones, but in the new covenant in your heart. In your mind, no longer ten commandments outside of you, but ten desires inside of you. Have to becomes want to. That's what you were talking about. That's that's, that's grace. You know, we have a brother Ted, don't have faith. Don't have faith. You don't have to. Hang in there. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of Paul. By the faith of the Son of God, I'm plugged in. I got the plug if you'll show me the socket. I know a name that'll plug you into the faith of God. 
saying that name, not just to say it articulately, he said, but that name through faith. God said, I'm going to abolish the old sacerdotal drudgery of the priesthood and all of you are going to know me for yourself. I'll be your God, you'll be my people. And we're going to have a new covenant relationship. You're going to be mine. You're going to be mine. And just as we link Jehovah with deliverance from Exodus, you link Jesus Deliverance from Egypt. But then how do we get out of Egypt? Just like children of Israel did. Do you know how they got out? By the blood of the Lamb, through the water, baptized in a glory cloud, full of the Lamb. You know how you're going to get out? By the blood, through the water, under the glory cloud, the Shekinah. Full of the Lamb. Oh, hallelujah. And all through the Exodus, Jehovah was connected with that cloud, that cloud in the wilderness. And when Jesus left, the Bible said He was received into a cloud. Do you think it was just a cloudy day? I don't think Jesus left on a cloudy day. I believe that was the Shekinah cloud that had followed Him. That was His grand finale. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And they looked up and saw Him on that cloud. They said, that's Him. That removes all doubt. He's Jehovah. He's riding the Jehovah cloud. And he's coming back on that same cloud. I will say of Jehovah, my refuge, my fortress. Not just Jehovah, but my Jehovah, my fortress, my refuge. That's covenant talk. I'm talking about somebody I know intimately. I'm not talking about a God floating around as an ethereal nebulous. But I'm talking about a God that will come down in my living room and your living room and sit down and commune with you. Hallelujah, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I'll come in and eat with him, sup with him, and he with me. I'll eat a covenant meal. God is limitless, my friend. There is there's no limit to God. No limit to God's knowledge. God knows all things that have ever been known. He knows the things that could have been, but weren't. He knows the things that are. He knows all things that might have been. He knows all things that will be. He knows everything that could be, but won't. He knows it all instantly, effortlessly, and eternally. And no man ever taught it to him. David said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I can't think of the knowledge of God. I can just proclaim it. God knows every thought that I ever thought. Every step I've ever taken. Every decision I've ever made. He knows what could have been and what isn't. He knows what I'm saying, what I'm thinking ever desire of my heart he's a discerner of the thoughts and intents he knows every step I'll take all the could be's and all that won't be's he is God now you know what that means that means that I've got a God tailor made custom made for my needs He gives himself for me just as I am. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. My strength. A fortress is a safe retreat. It's a shelter. I'm telling you, understand what it means to run into the name of the Lord. And to surround yourself with that name. That impenetrable name of God. My safety. Now we know from verse 1 of this psalm that we're overshadowed by Him. Now we know that we are, by verse 2, overwhelmed by His person. Overshadowed by His tent. And if you're feeling like I am, you're overwhelmed by His person. 
He doesn't live on a kind line. He can even go into the past. Some of you are sitting here tonight with things in your past haunting you. Needing deliverance. We don't talk enough about emotional healing. But since Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, since He's the God of yesterday, only Jesus can go into my past. And if you have something in your past that's draining your creative energies, old bitterness, old hates, old mistreatments, things that you brooded over, Jesus Christ can go right into your past and touch that septic tank and heal it. Oh, hallelujah! That means the end of worry. If we want it to be, why worry? You see, I'm standing on a timeline trying to send my little pea brain into tomorrow. Find out what's going on. And I find out I can't get into tomorrow. So I get up tight. Then I wonder about yesterday. And I wonder what my choices of yesterday are going to do to my tomorrows. And on and on we can go worry, worry, worry. And suddenly Jesus steps in and says, Hey, have you forgotten? I am. I've already been into your tomorrow, TF, arranging it, organizing it. But I don't know where I'm going. I am your shepherd. Well, what are you sitting there fretting about it before? You can't cross the timeline, but I can. Good man steps the order of the Lord. Good man stops the order of the Lord. God could have given Israel six months supply. He could have given them a six months mountain of manna. He could have dumped it down and said, there's manna, last for six months, I'll be back in six months and give you some more. But he didn't do it. He said you're going to have to go out every day and get it. You know why? That means you are never more than 24 hours away from testing and proving that God is God and He keeps His Word. Oh, Lord, six months from now, six... Nah, he said, about 24 hours is all I'm going to let you have. Oh, yeah. Woo! Because you're never over 24 hours away from hearing this Jehovah Musa, or this Jehovah, Jehovah Sitkanu, or this Jehovah Rapha. I want to keep you on intimate terms with me. And if I dumped it down in six months' loads, you don't want to look for me every six months. So, but according to my arrangement, you got to look for me every day, and that's the way I like it. Because that's what was lost in the Garden of Eden. I came down in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day, every day. And I'm trying to bring you back into this covenant relationship. Oh, God said, look, on Friday you gather enough for Saturday because this one's on me. Have a sweet day. You know why he said that? Because you've been resting on my promises all week. And the Sabbath gathers, gathers it all up in one and says, I am the God of rest. So you can rest in my word. What a God. Hebrews 13 and 5. And I, I hasten. Beautiful scripture. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But let me read that to you out of the amplified version. He himself has said. I will not. Now that's Jehovah that said that to Joshua. Jehovah Himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not in any degree live, leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, nor relax my hold on you, most assuredly not. Loving kindness. Loving kindness. How do I live in trust? He said, I'll say to Jehovah, you don't drift into walking into a life of peace. I'll say to Jehovah, my refuge, my fortress. He's not talking about a possibility, but he's taking a covenant fact and affirming it. We have gotten away from affirming the Word of God. You know how Jesus defeated the devil? With the raw word. Yes, he did. By affirming. Yes. It is written. Zap. Right. Satan came back. 
He got four little old bullets out of the arsenals of Deuteronomy. And we got a whole book full of them. Mm. Uh, he, he wasn't doing a lot of whining and crying. He just said, I will say to Jehovah, my refuge. He's my refuge. A fact of affirmation. We get on that merry-go-round of worries and worries and worries and worries and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. And thinking. And stop the merry-go-round and, and just say, what is this? It's running me nuts. And then ask yourself, does this agree with the Word of God? What does the Word say? Well, let's see. The Word said, the Lord is my strength and refuge. The eternal God who never changes and keeps His covenant word. This doesn't agree with what's going on in my mind. So I'm going to believe the word. Get out of my mind. You have to affirm truth in the light of lies. That's what the devil was doing. Lying to Jesus. Jesus just looked back and said, it is written. What are you going to believe? Circumstances or the word? Psalms 23 wasn't written for funerals. We preach it at funerals. It's all right. It's an affirmation. Jewish tradition says the 23rd Psalm was written when Saul was closing in on David to kill him. And in the face of fear and doubt, David picked up his quill and started writing, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not vote. Your enemies, he spreads a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He's going to die. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And he affirmed it. I'm going to dwell in the house of Jehovah forever. Uh, hallelujah. The Lord is my refuge. Whom shall I fear? David was distressed. Give me five more minutes. David was distressed. First Samuel 30 and 6. Ziglag. Can you imagine what happened to that man? Saul had been chasing him like a dog. He said, you're after me like I was a dog. He was run out of his home. He had lived in caves. He'd been out trying to do God's work and he comes back to Ziklag and his village is burned and their wives and children are captive slaves. The Bible says that David was distressed. Now notice that word. The Hebrew word distressed means to be in a place that gets narrower and narrower. And here was David driven out of my home hated by my king, pursued like a dog, fighting to do the right thing, trying to keep the right spirit. I could have killed him and didn't. Come back to Ziklag. Wife, children, gone. Men going to stone me. It's narrower and narrower. Before long, it's going to meet. But suddenly, just before it met, the Bible said he encouraged himself in the Lord, and that's Jehovah. He got to calling on the covenant name of God. He encouraged himself. And the word encourage, as used here, means to bind everything together. And what he did is he got everything together. He said, come here, you ragged ends of my mind that's running me nuts. Let me bind you up. And he got to Jehovah. He ran into his fortress. And when he got there, he did some creative thinking. And he came out and said, I know what to do. But he had to run to his fortress and plug in to the great I Am. And all that I have preached to you about tonight is summed up in one name. If you can find the tent rope, I've given you the name. And I promise you that that name will bring peace. 
That name will bring righteousness. That name will bring joy. That name will bring healing. That name will bring bread, water, and Holy Ghost. That name will bring repentance. That name will bring remission of sins in the waters of baptism. Oh, that name, that covenant name. You know what the name Jesus means? Literally, it means Jehovah Savior. Oh, Jesus is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Jehovah Savior. Break it further down. I am the living eternal one who saves. You meet the Jehovah of the Old Testament in the Jesus of the New. Hey, hallelujah. Praise God. Philippians. Brother Cliff. Chapter 2. And verse 9 through 11. Listen to this. Wherefore, Wherefore also, hath also God hath highly exalted Him and given Him a name which is, and that means it's above every name that God ever used in the Old Testament. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's the apex. When you get there, you get to the top of God's name. There never will be another. A million years from now, I can tell you what you'll be calling Him. A billion years from now, I can tell you what you'll be calling Him. A trillion years from now, you'll still be on the apex of revelation. God has given Him a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus. Oh, everybody say it. Everybody say it. What's going to happen? What else? Heaven. Earth. Under the earth. And the book of Revelation says things in the sea. At the name of Jesus. Ever kneel bow and ever what? And that every tongue should confess. That what? That Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord to the glory of God the Father. How is it going to work, Brother Timmy? I don't know. But one day through heaven, I, that name is going to be called in a unique way. And Michael and Gage are going to be trotting across the courts of high glory. Glory to God. And the whales and the dolphins and the fish are going to be swimming in the sea. And the earthworms are going to be earthing. <laughs> Hallelujah. The humans that are here are going to be walking around and all of a sudden yeah. ringing throughout the universe and corridoring themselves down by the fiber of the earth, vibrating into the sea one time in a unique way. And unknown to me, a name is going to ring out through the universe. Jesus! Hitler, get ready! Mussolini, get ready! Madeline Murray, all her, get ready! Every knee is going to bow! Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus! Jesus is the Lord! Let's stand and praise Him! Let's stand and praise Him! Let's worship the Lord. Clap your hands to the Lord. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world.
Baptism is done to wash away our sins. Acts 22.16 Baptism is done to be reborn to new life. John 3.5 Romans 6.3-6 Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ. Galatians 3.26-27 and 27. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins for salvation, to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.